Well, I think as everyone here, also for me, it is a big honor to be here. I see that the audience actually has diminished a little bit, probably due to, well, I hope not the topic, but due to the time. Um, many people have talked about the intuitions that Francois has at other uh, areas than, let's say, his specific well, home area, if he has a home area, because I think he's at home everywhere. And actually, this title, What is a Good Model, relates to discussions we had often about statistics, yeah, because I think the intuition of uh, Francois is valid everywhere. Now, this joke has been made already, uh, and that's when, you, when you're at the end of uh, the day, uh, then you end up with many slides that people have seen already, and also many arguments. I mean, I started to Google Francois because I was searching for his Google index, and I was a bit surprised to find out that I couldn't find him on the Google index, but in the meantime, I found interesting information like this. Who is Francois Tardieu? Well, actually, there are many Francois Tardieu's. And I think every one of those, to some extent, well, does coincide with the Francois Tardieu that we know. Uh, so here's yet another one. Uh, <laughs> I thought this was the most appropriate one. And then finally, I found Francois, and indeed, well, and then in the, uh, there were the 275, but I mean, I wanted to have a chronological uh, impression of everything that he has done. Well, couldn't find it too easily. So, this for me was, I say, one of the major papers, one of the major thoughts, and exactly the same passage as uh, also Graham Hammer has shown already about the meta mechanisms. I mean, to a certain extent, the meta mechanism is still something magical. Um, I think Graham was uh, rather insistent that it was clear what it was, but to be honest, I was never so very clear what it was, but I thought it was very convenient to adapt that kind of argument. Because here we have the lines, without discussing the importance of elementary mechanisms, we propose that the way in which short-term me short mechanisms interact at larger scales of organization over longer time scales results in predictable emergent properties that can be considered as meta-mechanisms that may provide a mechanistic base for ecological models. But when you're a statistician, you read this differently. Oh, why does this thing move forward? Oh, shit. Yes. Because I saw it as, let's say, okay, you have a number of processes, a number of traits that develop together over time with environmental inputs, and evolution selection is shaping those influences, or is shaping, let's say, that, that, that correlation structure. And, well, some influences are more frequent than others, so after a certain while you end up with something behaving in a certain way in relation to one or a few of the particular um, environmental stimuli. And then the whole thing becomes a rather simple statistical model. Now, Graham will deny that, but we can discuss that later. So I also took a look, let's say, at everything that has been written about the underlying mechanisms, because, I mean, to be honest, to be a statistician that is interested in G by E, I think you should understand to a reasonable extent what is happening at the physiological and genetical and also the molecular level. Well, all of this has been showed already, so it's good because I don't need to explain it, and the risk that I do it wrongly is high. Uh, but this is something I can understand. And this... Mm, to be careful. Yeah, okay, so here is the meta mechanism and leaf at this change in, or the leaf elongation rate, uh, the change in leaf width or the leaf size, is a function of temperature, vapor pressure deficit, and water potential. And of course, yeah, this is a differential equation, linear in uh, the inputs and actually also linear in the parameters. So that's relatively easy to solve. These two papers have been shown a number of times as well. This is also, let's say, when I started to read the papers, I think. To be honest, we met in the context of the Generation Challenge program and immediately was interested, let's say, in the philosophy of Francois because for a statistician that sounded very attractive. Not too dogmatic about what is real biology and what isn't, uh, but in the end you want to be able to model something in relation to variables that you can observe. And also this thing was quite important. This appears in a number of papers. If, let's say, you have your genotypes responding to an environmental input and that creates G by E, uh, you want this, this parameter that determines how the genotype reacts. It needs to be relatively insensitive to environmental influence itself. I mean, if the leaf elongation rate itself changes from one experiment to the other, it's not very useful. So here in this paper, we see a large number of experiments that all for a particular genotype provide the same slope, uh, so the same leaf allocation rate, but if you do it for different genotypes, you see that the slope is different. So 
This is extremely useful. I remember that at the same time we had discussions with Stefan Welch about the same phenomenon, and Stefan Welch is also still very much preoccupied with when can you call something genotype specific, when not. Well, to be honest, from a statistical point of view, I don't care so much. If the set of environments for which I need to predict shows that a particular genotypic parameter doesn't change across that environmental range, I can use it as if it's a genotype specific parameter. And what I also liked is that, okay, we were going to map those genotype specific parameters, we got the QTLs, we inserted the QTLs, let's say, in the model for leaf elongation rate, and we could predict leaf elongation rate. And Francois did exactly that uh, as a well, time of day uh, vapor pressure deficit. So there was always a check with is the thing that I predict also visible in uh, particular experiments. And this paper, I think, was one of the well, essential papers in the thinking of, well, at least myself, but you see that many people in the audience are involved in this. And also, where is it? Graham was the writer, of course. Uh, Mark Cooper was very instrumental, but Stefan Welch was there. I mean, this shaped the way in which we're still, uh, let's say, modeling G by E to an enormous extent. So I remember that in a number of those papers, still 2004, uh, Francois was very insistent that you needed a good physiological model to predict for new environments. And, well, we had a discussion at the airport of Rome in which I claimed that uh, there was no need for whatever kind of physiological model I could do it without a physiological model. Well, Francois didn't believe that. So here's a paper from 2004 in which we model QTL by E uh, in which, let's say, the QTL changes expression over the environment in relation, in this case, to a temperature range. This is the famous uh, Steptomorex barley data set. And there was a QTL that, um, on chromosome 2H that responded to temperature. So here was an example in which a statistical model also would allow you to predict for new environments as long as you knew this, this temperature range. Not so very different, I would say, from leaf elongation rate, but I know that the physiologists will not agree with that. And we did the same story in a number of other papers, even with physiologists. Now, to make this point about the metamechanism a little bit stronger, here we start from a purely statistical description of a reaction norm. We have genotype I and environment J, and let's say the, the, the yield is related uh, to temperature in this curvilinear way. And so that we have, we have an optimum temperature in which the yield is highest, and we have a kind of tolerance within which the, green, the genotype still will grow reasonably well. Now, your parameter vector consists of the maximum here, it consists of the width of this tolerance, and it con contains the, the optimum temperature. If you want to assume that each of those three parameters for the reaction norm has a genetic basis that is additive in some genes or QTLs, then it turns out that if you fit a model for yield, that you find QTL by E uh, in this model in which the QTL expression is a direct function of temperature, even a linear function. And you can see it over here. Oh, these are terrible things. Uh, where am I? Yeah. I'm going the wrong direction. I, I don't know where I am. <laughs> okay. So, if we talk about metamechanisms, uh, I think of metamechanisms as averaging across particular conditions, and if you start off from a relatively statistical model, you can still end up with something that looks like a metamechanism. Okay, now, what am I interested in? Well, most of my work consists in, let's say, modeling G by E by M situations. What do we have nowadays? Well, we have multi-environment trials, we have managed stress trials, we have yield as an endpoint trait, we have phenology, we have a lot of phenomics, secondary traits, that often are longitudinal, uh, measured at all kinds of intervals. We have genomics, we have environomics. This is your standard data set nowadays. So if you look at the literature, what do people do? The statisticians don't want to think too long, uh, and they create what they call kernels, but the kernel is nothing else than that you use all of your genetic information to calculate the similarity between two genotypes, you use all of your environmental information to calculate the similarity between two environments. If genotypes are similar, they get the same prediction. If environments are similar, they get the same prediction. If a combination of genotype and environment is similar, it gets the same prediction. This is the trick after, well, behind all multi-kernel models, and you can make it very complicated and very Bayesian, but in the end, this is about it, and on average, it doesn't work. So, as an alternative, 
Uh, also, the physiologists are working in this area, and uh, Graham Hammer already gave an exposition of the whole genome prediction crop growth model. Here, of course, there is a crop growth model that, that in the end, translates the environmental inputs into yields. And there are a few, let's say, yield uh, components that are fed by a market profile. So this works reasonably, uh, but let's say my complaint is a little bit that this kind of modeling doesn't use any observed information on yield components of secondary trace over the growing season. Okay, um, we have tried ourselves together with Francois, together with Graham, etc. No, sorry, yeah, no, Graham was not together with Francois and, uh, and Alain. Uh, we have been working with Emily, in which we had the QTLs in the drops panel being, well, function of water, vapor pressure, the fishes, etc. We had, let's say, the QTL expressions dependent on the environmental scenario. We had the QTLs dependent in a nonlinear way on soil water potential. This all worked really well. Somewhere in between, let's say, statistics and the whole, grown, whole genome crop growth model. We extended that, and this paper was shown a number of times to genomic prediction. And to be honest, this is a very simple model in which the genotypes are sensitive to a limited number of environmental drivers. And you simply predict the sensitivity of the genotypes uh, by a genomic profile. And that's the story, and that allows you to predict to a new environment. So going back to inspiration for statistical models in the work uh, of uh, Francois, I also had a look at this rather physiological paper. And what I liked about this paper is here we have a number of underlying phenotypes that in the end are important for yields. They evolve over time, they interact with each other, uh, and together they show adaptive behavior. And together, let's say, with the insights of Francois on phenomics, in which you try to observe things that you can use in a later model to predict yields, uh, we started to think that also statistically we could benefit strongly from what people are doing nowadays in phenomics. So we started to reconsider our purely statistical modeling framework, and let's say together with people at uh, Corteva, uh, we built up a set of differential equation models, imitating to a large extent, I think, what is there in crop growth models already. But the issue is here a little bit that from the start onwards, we are thinking about the fact that we need to generalize this to hundreds of genotypes. The parameters in those models that are genotype specific need to be able to be estimated for many genotypes using, let's say, phenotyping devices, phenotyping platforms. So in a nutshell, uh, we think that typically there's a major stress that we might be able to identify. Uh, well, how should this uh, or differential equation system look like? Well, it should have something that can, observed, can be observed on resource capture, something on resource conservation, and something on harvest index. If we can get the dynamics that are related to those processes together, we should be in a reasonable situation to, to predict what yield is going to be. And we want a limited number of dynamical parameters for which, one, which we have to find the genetic basis. And we want to keep everything in a statistical context because then we know what we're doing with inference. We don't overfit and we know what the errors, how the errors will propagate. Well, here are a few of these models. I will not explain them in detail. I mean, they are familiar. We also looked at the Arrhenius model in which, let's say, also Francois ended up in a lot of discussion with other physiologists. Uh, we have a logistic model, a Arrhenius model, a temperature model, a water model. So we fitted first, the, well, we first defined those models and fitted them for individual genotypes, and individual environments, but that's not so terribly interesting. A lot of people can do that. There's a lot of software that does it. In the end, uh, well, no, let me first show this. It's a pen ultimate one, so I think I'm still fine with time. Yes, two slides left. So here you see for the individual genotypes how it works. Well, this is bioma. Oh, fuck, sorry. <laughs> This is, I don't understand who invented this thing. Uh, how do I get back to the... Because this usually happens. Uh, and now I have to go to the end. Okay, yes. And now switch. Okay. So... Biomass, be careful. I mean, here we have biomass over time. Uh, logistic, uh, limited by irradiance, limited by temperature. And here, <sighs> I can't do this. Well, let's, I, I'll bring it back like this and forget about it. Where is it? Okay. 
Doesn't matter too much. Okay. Yeah. 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 But I wanted to shortcut it, but I guess we'd not touch this thing anymore. <laughs> uh, okay. These were the models. I mean. And the one that is most interesting is here at the one at the bottom. There we have a coupled system of differential equations, one giving the biomass uh, over time, uh, and the other one the water status in the soil. So here we have two state variables that we model together. They are interacting and they allow us, let's say, to make the plant growth dependent on well, the direct environment. And maybe we need to go further than that, but at least this is a start. And so the next step, and this looks very complicated, but the main thing that we try to do then is to fit these kinds of models, uh, differential equations, coupled differential equations for large sets of genotypes and environments simultaneously. We're in a Bayesian context, you can nowadays, uh, there are special packages uh, like STEN and implementation of R, of uh, STEN in R that allow you to do this. And one of the major uh, important, well, uh, this is dangerous, I'm going to do now, but let's say, you see here a uh, variation on the logistic model that we started with. Now the parameters in the logistic model, uh, the asymptote, the growth rate, and the halfway point, those have been made functions themselves of genotype and environment again. So if you want to test whether those parameters are genotype specific, you can test whether there's interaction between G by E for that partic particular parameter. So it's, a, it's a hierarchical model, and if there is no interaction, well, then you can be reassured that you're looking at a genotype-specific parameter that you can use for prediction. And so the final one, um, what is a good model? I mean, much, many of the criteria I put on this slide actually are directly related to discussions I had with Francois. Uh, a good model is dynamic, time-resolved, and I think this has become more and more important. With phenomic data, we do have access to this time-dependence, a good model does multiple traits simultaneously and also allows these interactions, the, the, these, in, these traits to interact. And one of the things, of course, that we think about, yield we only observe at the end of the growing season, but in our differential equation system, yield can be present as already a latent variable. Uh, there can be interactions with yield during the growing season. Okay, these interactions are already mentioned. This is the other thing. There should be the possibility of different uh, time scales, but typically we hope that the system let's say, well, generalizes averaging across all kinds of factors to some meta, meta mechanism that is simpler. Um, this is a very important one. The parameters and state variables in our systems preferentially are observable in phenotyping systems. And for the number of parameters for which we hope that they are genotype specific, we hope that there are a few. So sparsity is, I think, an important element of these models. Otherwise, we cannot estimate them for large sets of genotypes. Then the environmental and genotype range should be defined. We should know for which environments, target population environment we're working, same for the genotypes. Well, and this thing over here, I mean, we, we can do this in a Bayesian likelihood framework, Bayesian uh, framework, so that we keep all the inference together. And I think that's it. I can't read this last anymore, but we'll be okay. Okay.